let's talk about that fact that, that our, our economy has been geared toward the college graduate for 60 years at this point, that basically for the last three generations, there's been a huge push that every single person needs to go to college. You and I talked about this back in 2018. And, and many of these people are not getting degrees in, in anything productive. It's not like they're going into a STEM field where they're actually learning a skill set. They're doing what I did, and they're getting a poli-sci degree, mainly so they can go to law school. Or if they can't go to law school, they get a poli-sci degree and then hope to latch on at, at some sort of white-collar job doing desk work somewhere. But a lot of those degrees are effectively worthless or, or counterproductive, given that they're now being put into serious debt. So let's say that you have an 18-year-old, and you're now thinking about college. This has actually become a big issue in my personal community because obviously you've seen a, a wide increase in anti-Semitism a, on a lot of these college campuses. So I'm getting a lot of questions on a personal level from Orthodox Jews who are coming to me like, I have an 18-year-old. My, my kid doesn't want to be a doctor, doesn't want to be an engineer. What do I do with my kid? And what I've been saying to them is you might want to think very seriously about seeing if you can find an apprenticeship for your kid. With a, with a good business and, and seeing if you can, you know, take all the money you're going to pour into college and then maybe give them a, a chestnut that they can use to build a business once they actually have a skill set. What's the, what's the case you'd make to an 18-year-old? When is it good to go to college? When is it bad to go to college? Well, what would you be telling an 18-year-old who isn't necessarily going to be a doctor? Yeah, I mean, it would have to be a very personal conversation. <clears throat> One of the things I've become deeply uh, skeptical of is cookie-cutter advice, bromides, platitudes, the, the desire to paint with a broad brush is part of the reason we got into this problem, right? People started to say in an attempt to make a more persuasive case for higher education, they started to say all sorts of great things about those outcomes. But then as with all PR, we went too far and we weren't content to simply say, look at all the great things that higher education give you. We had to say, if you don't do that, you're going to wind up over here turn in a wrench with some vocational consolation prize, right? We, and this always happens. We always, always, always go too far. We're trying to make a case for a thing that needs some love, but we do it at the expense of all the other things. Then you pull shop class out of high school contemporaneously with that and remove from view all optical proof of these other vocations. And presto, you got a whole generation of kids who don't even know these jobs exist, right? So we did that. And that was super dumb. And, and, and now, you know, parents are looking for advice. We, we are looking for a simple thing to say to an 18 year old kid who's, who's trying to, you know, weigh and measure the whole thing, but it's tough for the reason you just brought up. I always used to think, look, regarding my own liberal arts education, I value it a great deal, but it didn't cost a great deal. You know, I, I went to a community college that happened to have some great teachers. And then I went to a university for a couple of years, got my basic communications degree from, from Towson state. And when I added it all up, right, the community college, a couple of years at the university graduated in 1984, the whole, the whole thing was $12,200 today, the same course load, same schools, it's like $94,000. And so my thing was always, look, you, you, you can't say a thing is valuable at any cost without having a rational conversation about debt. So I always kind of stayed in, in that lane. And in that lane, I've been able to say, look, I got this device here. You know, I, like we said earlier, I'm, I'm tapped into 99% of the known information in, in the history of time. I just watched a lecture on my device over at MIT for free. Okay. So, you know, the access to all of that information is wildly different than it was when I graduated in, in the mid eighties from school. And, and the fact that the price has increased at the rate it has, I mean, nothing, Ben, and nothing in the history of Western civilization has become more expensive than a four year degree over the last 40 years, not energy, not real estate, not healthcare. Not, uh, not nothing, right? And yet, it's still there. So I, I still make that point a lot. But to your point, the idea that not only is it too expensive, but it's damn dangerous. That too many of these schools are aggressively and willfully ignoring our past, if not changing our past. I hate to say indoctrination centers because you know it's that's turning into a platitude as well. And I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but I'll tell you this, 
Never, I've been doing this 16 years, raising money for work ethic scholarships and giving a couple million bucks away every year. Never before, not since Labor Day of 2008 anyway, has higher ed made my job easier. <laughs> Never before have the headlines sent more people with deep pockets to MicroWorks to say, you know something? I'm simply not going to reward Harvard. And with respect, I know you graduated there, but come on, man, $51 billion in endowment, and we are now forgiving the loans from some Harvard grads? What is? What are we doing? I mean, I tell me if I'm wrong. I think I got this right, though. In the in the late 1950s, the uh, the average GPA for a Harvard graduate was something like 2.6, 2.7. Today it's 3.9. Talk about inflation. <laughs> what's happening at Harvard? What's happening at Brown? What's happening at Dartmouth and Yale and so forth is is extraordinary, both on the the front that you mentioned, the protests, the plagiarism, tearing through the administration, all, all, all of that stuff is making parents and donors nervous in ways that are totally different from the mere outrageousness of the cost. So what do I tell an 18-year-old in light of all of that? I say put every single option on the table. And I mean from apprenticeships, all of the scholarships, the Ivy League, community colleges, every single thing. And don't forget about the magic box that gives you access to the best liberal arts degree you could ever have at an affordable price. Don't, don't forget that, but weigh it and measure it and make your decision and know that in the words of Led Zeppelin, there'll still be time to change the road you're on. You want to know how to run your company's finances smoother than a well-oiled machine? You need to check out Ramp. Ramp is a corporate card and spend management software designed to help you save time and put money back in your pocket. Ramp gives your finance team unprecedented control over company spending. You can issue cards to every employee with actual limits and restrictions, a novel concept in today's world of runaway expenses. Ramp's accounting software automatically collects receipts and categorizes your expenses in real time. No more chasing down receipts. Your employees won't waste hours on expense reports. That allows you to close your books eight times faster. Unlike most so-called money-saving solutions, Ramp actually puts cash back in your pocket. Businesses using Ramp save an average of 5% in their very first year. Plus, it's easier to set up than my son's Lego sets. You can get started, issue virtual and physical cards, and start making payments in less than 15 minutes, whether you have five employees or 5,000. Right now, get 250 bucks when you join Ramp. Just go to ramp.com slash Shapiro. That's ramp dot com slash Shapiro, R-A-M-P dot com slash Shapiro. Cards issued by Sutton Bank member FDIC. Terms and conditions do apply. Yeah, there's so many bubbles that are associated with higher education. There's the price bubble where obviously the demand has outstripped the supply largely because of subsidies from the government because you can get easy, cheap money from the government to go to college. And, and so everything the government subsidizes has become more expensive. And, and then you have the ideological bubble that has expanded and expanded and expanded and I think separated off the normal American from the universities in a particularly perverse way. I, I, I really think that, I've said this for a long time, there's been a lot of attempts to explain the phenomenon of Donald Trump or the blue collar love for Donald Trump as a sort of reflection of economic concerns. What I've always said is that that's wrong. It's a cultural concern. It's the fact that Donald Trump took these people seriously as opposed to all the college graduates who were staffing up the Obama administration who really kind of looked down on people who worked blue collar jobs and and who saw those people as having bitter clinger values. That Donald Trump has always represented a cultural challenge to a, an endemic hegemony of, of the left more than he has an economic challenge, per se. Uh, and so there's that bubble, this ideological bubble that exists on campus. And then there's this third bubble that I think is really going to burst pretty quickly. And that's something we talked about back in 2018, but with regard to blue-collar jobs. And as it turns out, it's actually more of a threat to white-collar jobs, and that is AI. So there's a lot of talk about how AI was going to put a bunch of blue-collar workers out of work circa 2018. And here there was a lot of talk specifically about, say, truck drivers. And that was a concern. It remains a concern. We are close to self-driving technology, which is going to lower the cost on a lot of goods and services, obviously, because shipping costs are, are very large when you're talking about supply chains. However, the vast majority of jobs that are set to just get destroyed by AI are all in the white-collar domain. A huge number of lawyers are going to lose their jobs because of AI. A huge number of journalists are going to lose their jobs because of AI. If you have a college degree in the liberal arts, your job just became way more expendable. If you have an art degree 
AI is going to be able to outdo you very quickly. It, it, I, I don't know whether that's because it was made by people who had those kinds of degrees or whether it's simply that it's easier to synthesize information in in these sorts of verbal or artistic forms than it is to actually work in the real world. One of the th- and you've seen this with machines. Machines are, are are very good at performing simple tasks, but they can't like clean your room for you because that involves a right. bunch of different tasks put together. So it looks like there's going to be a resurgence in the blue collar market, and there's going to be a downturn in some of the white collar market. Look, if you're a fan of irony, it, it's it's it, it's delicious. And I say that with great respect to anybody who's going to be adversely impacted. But I spent a lot of time, 2016, 17, 18, every every symposium I was invited to, every talk I gave, every think tank that welcomed me, you know, the, it, it always came back not to AI, but to tech in general and robotics and the displacement impact that that was going to have on the jobs that my foundation typically focuses on. And I spent a lot of time, you know, trying to thread that needle. I talked a lot about the Luddite revolution. I talked about the fact that, look, it's not it's not going to be as clear as you think it is. There will be an impact, and there are some uh, robotic w- welding situations happening now that that are mind-bogglingly efficient and effective. And it and it did have an impact, but it didn't have the impact that anyone thought. Not nearly to the degree. In fact, if you want job security right now, it is plumbing, steam fitting, electric, and it's the skilled trades. It's all that stuff. It's never been more secure than it is right now. But wow, dude, the AI thing, I don't even, somebody sent me a link the other day and said, you just got to click on this, Mike. I asked the program to narrate a couple of paragraphs of this this thing I'm working on in the style of Mike Rowe narrating Deadliest Catch. And I clicked on it, and I listened to it. And had he not told me what it was, I would have simply assumed, yeah, that's something I did five or six years ago. I, I don't remember it, but it's me. Well, it's not, you know. And so you're right. I, I believe the impact on all the fields you mentioned is going to be real. But you mentioned art, too. And I'd love to riff on that with you for a minute, because when you take the art out of a thing, whatever the thing is, that's that's almost always the beginning of the end of the thing. And it's true of shop class. It's true of the skilled trades. You know, I'm old enough to remember when I was in high school, that stuff was called the vocational arts. And then they took out the art and it became Votech. <laughs> Once you hyphenate something, you know, forget the end is near. <laughs> Votech turns into a, a, a bunch of squishy other acronyms I don't even remember. And then we just settled on shop, right? Shop. And then we walked it behind the barn and shot it. And that's how we got shop class out of high school, right? We started by retweaking the language and removing the art. When I think of AI and when I think of the possibility, I mean, what are you going to do when the machine, with the help of AI, can create a Picasso or a Manet or a Monet or a, or a Renoir or a Da Vinci that, that is virtually indistinguishable, even with the greatest authenticators and the greatest umpires coming in. And when, when they can't tell the difference between a Beatles song that was just discovered that nobody ever heard and the fake <laughs> that was just discovered that nobody ever heard, right? What's going to happen to the way we think about creativity and originality and ownership and money? How are we going to assign a value to a fake that's better than the original? What is scarcity going to mean in all of these places? It's going to, it's going to not just change the way people get paid to do stuff. It's going to fundamentally jack with our, with our whole value system and the and and the way we assign gratitude to a thing right if a difficult thing is now made with such ease how are we to think about that too 